here at Elam Restoration Ministries. We thank you for our online audience, that you can touch them right where they are. Give your servant plainness of speech, but more than that, on our ears that we may hear what your spirit is saying to the church, and we're thanking, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. going to go to the book of Isaiah chapter number nine very familiar scripture just verse six and seven and we'll read also in the book of Revelations uh, chapter number 11 verse 15 and our custom if you stand in reverence of reading the word of God Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7 says this. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government, everybody say government, shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace. Everybody say, government and peace. There shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom or his empire to order it to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this all the way to the book of Revelation chapter number 11 verse 15 and the seventh angel sounded and there was a great voice in heaven, or voices in heaven, saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, or his anointed. And he shall reign for ever and ever. The word of the Lord is blessed. You may be seated. I want to talk to you briefly, hopefully briefly, about the subject, the greatest government there will ever be. The greatest government there will ever be. The greatest government that there will ever be is the kingdom of God. Ruled by his firstborn son, Jesus Christ himself. Isaiah prophesied and says, this government shall be on his shoulders. I think it's very befitting because Michigan... It's what they call a swing state. And some of us are getting caught up in this election. And I want to draw your minds in. If you're caught up, a little anxiety, a little anxious about who's going to be president, who's qualified, who's, ain't, who's not qualified, and, 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 and you got a strong opinion about it, too strong of an opinion in some cases. I want to set some things in order in your mind. When you look at government and you look at Jesus and it says the government shall be on his shoulder, what he's trying to focus us on, you're living in a world that 
have empires. It has kingdoms. It has countries. But spiritually, he's talking about a kingdom that is going to rest on Jesus, not on natural candidates. So you won't be in despair looking for another Messiah, another Savior, another Deliverer who will make your life peaceful, prosperous. Because birds are commonly said to be laid upon men's shoulders. And as in all government, it is, and if it's managed right, will be very heavy. It's a burden. It's a responsibility. It's like being a parent. You might want a baby to love and cuddle, but after a while, you'll discover that's a human being. Independent of your thoughts and feelings, that will develop into an autonomy. And the most difficult part of your life, if you're a parent and you have experience, it's not when the baby is a baby. It is those adolescent years, right before being an adult, where they naturally should be pulling away and becoming an autonomy. And, and, and you're trying to govern their behavior, because that's what this is about. Managing their lives require extraordinary care and diligence and self-denial. When you have a teenager, you want to go wherever they want to go, but they want to use your car. When they need gas money. Now, it's, 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 it's very difficult for them because they want to be grown, and you want them to be grown. And what's difficult is you got to treat them like they're going to become, not like who they are. You might not like it, but context is very important. And I preach from the context of the 50s. You may agree or disagree that being born in 1950 is irrelevant. But if you think like that, then I'm irrelevant. And the year that I was born was irrelevant. And it doesn't really mean anything. But look at your neighbor and say, but he's still here. Therein lies the problem. I'm still here. I have a context that doesn't fit the day I'm living in. It doesn't fit, but I'm still here. And the reason why I'm still here is because your future is rooted in my history. Yes, the whole Bible is, is a historical writing. And your salvation is rooted in the history of salvation. Because Revelation concludes it. In other words, it says the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord. All authority will be under his rule. <clears throat> so he's letting you know how it's going to end. But we go to Genesis and we get stuck there. And then as we move forward a couple thousand years, we couldn't have a conversation with Moses and Elijah like Jesus did. I often wonder why God thought it was necessary for Jesus to talk to Moses and Elijah. You got to know Moses and Jesus is like 1,500 years apart in age. 
and Elijah and Moses is about 500 years apart, and Elijah and Jesus is about 900. So you got these guys having a conversation. And I guarantee you, Jesus didn't say to Moses, it's a different day. <laughs> Things have changed. We don't, people are different. We don't do that anymore. Because they were talking about something that was timeless. And Luke, I don't know how he gets to Revelation, tells what they was talking about. His death, his departure. His sacrifice that all of the prophets talked about. What causes a strain is when an adolescent, young adult, and parents try to have a dialogue and they're talking about two different things. And the child is trying to tell the parent what day it is. When it really doesn't matter because it ain't the parent's day. What they're trying to do is give you something that's timeless. How many parents tell babies as they start to grow up, stop pouting? Don't raise your hand. I Googled. They got all kind of parenting styles now. <laughs> Blew my mind. As though you can write a book on how to raise a kid. There is no book other than this one that deals with human nature. My wife and I had six of them and, and, and a couple of them. I was like, where you come from? <laughs> I mean, totally. One of them had the nerve to tell me I don't fit in this family. I said, yes, you do, because obviously you fit because you showed up in it. <laughs> Some people you don't order. They just show up <laughs> totally different. And I love genetics <laughs> because <laughs> my, my youngest son, he showed up so bright, light eyes, different texture, hair. Uh, so I would like to believe. Since my name is Adolphus Cast, this is just conjecture, that somewhere along the line it was Castiglione, Italian, and they cut it short and <laughs> made it cast. Because <laughs> that kid didn't look like he fit in my family. Those eyes and hair texture and all that, because genetics, you go down your family tree. Both parents can have a different pigmentation, and then the kid come in totally different. That's why you go, you, you could have the, all those tests they have and find out your lineage. I don't be checking mine. I don't. Because some stuff you don't want to find out. Right. <laughs> I would like to believe I was from royalty or somewhere. But I'm talking about the greatest government. Managing, governing, Jesus running and managing and governing, ruling in the hearts of people. Question, how do you enact laws for humanity and cause them to submit to them? except to be done by the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Because in the kingdom, first of all, all our enemies must be conquered. Our lives, our property, our rights, our liberties have to be protected. There must be a supply of all things pertaining to life. And godliness. That's what the candidates offer. If you vote for me, I will give you these things. And it's amazing how human beings pick the side of the person that is saying what they think they need. 
Let me say that again. They asked me, Rolling Stone magazine came to our church and asked me, how did we go from Democratic Barack Obama to Donald Trump Republican? I said, because his words resonated to a certain demographic. It resonated. Meaning words is one thing, who a person is, is another. I said, what you actually have, <coughs> excuse me, what you actually have is not the candidates. You might not like this, but listen very carefully. It is never about the candidate. It is about the society in which they govern. It is about us, not them. Let me say it again. It is about us and not them. Because if we were what we should be, let me cut to the chase. It's impossible to govern an immoral people. Can't be done. God tried it, and he knew what he was doing. Governing is the exercise of authority and administering laws, laws that control, direct, and regulate what? Everybody say behavior, such as the Decalogue of the Ten Commandments, which was a basic set of rules given by God carrying binding authority, which he instituted to govern Israel to prove all humanity was under sin, Romans 3. And it says this, now we know that what things soever the law said, the Ten Commandments or whatever, it say to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and what all the world may become guilty before God. See, people think that God made Israel, gave them the law, and they were above humanity. But he did it to prove they were an example of all of us. It says, verse 20, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the what? Knowledge of sin. He just wanted us to know who we were and what our nature is. I want you to know what this is. He said, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is what? No difference between Jew and Gentile. Here's a scripture we butcher. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, you have to know that that's Greek. That's not English. And if you look up all have sin, you'll find the Greek word miss the mark. We usually say it like all have sin means everybody done something wrong. All have sin. You did something. So if I mess up, I'll come to you and say, for all have sin and come like you did something too. That's not what they're saying. What it's saying is the mark that was missed was the fact that our nature was compromised in the Garden of Eden. God had a mark for humanity. The first mark, you were created to die. You was created to live forever. Death is an enemy. So the main mark we miss is we die. It's not, see, the worst thing is not you cheating on your wife. The worst thing is the fact that you decay. Yeah. Slow. 
It's a slow death. I was looking, I have a picture of me at 16, looking like my youngest son. I mean identical. 16. I'm 74. And when I look at that picture and I look in the mirror, slow death. Oh, yeah. I don't have as many teeth as I used to have. <laughs> and I look for, I Google, why do I repeat myself? And they say old people repeat themselves because of loss of brain cells. And the only way to deal with that is you either divert the conversation, if I'm saying the same thing, try to say something different, so maybe I'll go that way. The only other way is to be kind and act like that's the first time you heard it. You can't say, you said that 10 times. That doesn't replenish brain cells because you rebuke me for repeating myself. I don't care how many times you tell me I said that already. It doesn't fix the decay in my mind. So I'm going to say it again. And you have to be kind enough to act like you just heard it. Go like that's very interesting. Don't get upset, because keep living. That's all my mother used to say. She said, keep living. She said, once a man, twice a child. That was the old Alabama saying. At all points, God say that you came in here, you'll leave the same way you came. No teeth, no hair. Being held by the hand, walking through the mall. I was watching the young lady had her mother going through the mall. Mother was walking like the little baby, little steps. I said, I wasn't saying you were pulling her too fast. <laughs> but she's probably said, when I was a baby and my legs this short, have you seen a parent pull a baby too fast? Look at your name and say, that'll be you if, it ain't, if you ain't already there. I told you, me and my wife, we both 74. I got a half a brain, she got the other half. We put them together, we got a whole. It says, for all have fallen short. So when you, you don't have to worry about doing anything, you are short. You have missed the mark of what God wanted us to be as humans. Also in this life, there are civil laws, family, and government, church government. Everybody say church government. That's why I did the bishop elect, because there are offices in church that are governing offices. They're not all the offices in church aren't government. You have to have government for order so people will behave. Let me start by saying this. Government is ordained by God for the good of people. God is not against government. But there are many types of government. Everybody say many types. There's a democracy. There's a monarchy. There's an oligarchy. There's a dictatorship. There's a representative democracy. There's a, total, uh, a totalitarianism. There's an uh, aristocracy. And there's what God called a theocracy. Just to name a few. A theocracy is a form of government where a person or a group of people uh, rule in the name of a deity. That was the priesthood. God was God, but then he had a theocracy. He had the priest representing who? Him. Nobody could approach God except the priest. You study Old Testament history. I'm talking about the government of God. God is exclusive. <laughs> so he said, you have to wear this. And you can only come and see me once a year. All the other times you go out there and make sacrifice. Most people don't know the high priest couldn't go in the Holy of Holies every Sunday. Some of y'all getting happy. Because that way you would only have church what? Once a year. 
That's how exclusive God was. You're not coming back here every Sunday. One time a year, and you're going to make atonement for yourself and for the people. And if that high priest wasn't living in the realm of behaving appropriately with God, he would die back there. And all the beautiful regalia that you'll see pastor uh, uh, transition into his bishop uh, elect garbs. Those high priests took all of that off to go visit God. And all they had on was white linen, breeches, and a top. He said, now all that royalty that you had in front of the people, take it off coming to me. Because ain't nobody back here that's royalty but me. I'm not impressed by what you have on or the office that I have given you. What I'm talking about when I say the greatest government, I'm talking about a life that is lived in the spirit. The issue here is not the type of government, whether it's Democrat or Republican. That is best for humanity. But our fallen nature is the problem. It's actually, once again, impossible to govern an immoral people. Look at all the wars around the world. Think about it. And sometimes a candidate will say, I'm going to stop the war in this place. I'm going to stop the war in that place. And it will always be because of the desires of our flesh, we have to try to take something. There is no peace in our life when we're fighting to acquire something. But Romans 8 say there is no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus who do what? Who do not walk after the flesh but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. I'm going somewhere. Pray for me. And what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sin in the flesh and for sin redeemed us. He condemned sin in the flesh. For what reason? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Law becomes weakened. It loses its strength when this fella is involved. Anytime you put flesh, let me tell you something. Study 1 Samuel. When the people of God did not want God, but Samuel thought it was him. His sons messed up as priests. And they came to Samuel and said, we want a king. We don't want no priest or judge to go in front of us. We need a king. Samuel said, I haven't taken your money. I haven't done this. He's, be, he's pleading his cause. God said, come here, Samuel. He said, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. He said, now, give them a king. But protest. What are you saying? Give them what they asked them for, but tell them what they're going to get. Because you do not want anybody ruling you with the same propensities that you had. You don't want nobody in charge that, because, oh, I'm going to tell on some of these parents. While I'm telling on myself, sometimes the shoe can be on the step all week. You can have a bad day at the office. But when you come home, because you have the same propensities as a human being, you get on the baby for the shoe too hard. He said, that shoe been there all week. If you don't pick that shoe up, 
go to your room, you on a punishment, you going nuts. And the kid is like, what? The shoe been there all week. It ain't been bothering anybody. Why is it such a, have, don't raise your hand. I know I had to apologize for some spankings I gave. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Undirected anger. Where the punishment don't fit the crime. Something else going on internally. The baby don't know why the spanking is so severe. Don't know you just got fired and you're mad at your boss, but they spilled some milk and you're like, I told you to watch what you're doing. Don't know, the baby don't know. Ain't that what your boss told you this morning when he fired you? You should have been watching what? Under same propensities. So he said, give him a king, but I'm going to tell him he's going to take all the best horses, all the fine women. He's going to take your healthy sons. They're going to work for him. He's going to put them in. He named all the stuff. What happens? He said, you're going to get somebody that need you. I'm a God that meet needs. I don't want nothing from you but your good. People thinking God got a problem. He don't need money. He don't, he don't need anything. God said, if I was hungry, I wouldn't tell a human. If I had an appetite, I wouldn't say, I need some food. Nothing. So you do not want to put another human being in the place of God where you're creating anxiety because your expectation is in the wrong place. He said, do not do it. Protest and tell them what they're going to get. What man needs 600 wives? Because he could have them. He's in charge. You know he messed up. Should have been out to war. He looking over the terrace. And Uriah's wife is out there bathing. He's, he's a man. He's human. He's royalty. All he did was tell his servants, bring her to me. That's where you get the Psalms. David is writing. He's repenting. He's broken. Created me a clean heart and renewed me a right spirit. To you alone have I committed this sin. God was watching him. He said, now, I'm going to talk to you, but Nathan going to be my spokesperson. And you're going to come up with your own sentence that I'm going to commute. I'm going to move it away. Nathan told him a man in a parable. I got the clothes. He said, it was a man that had one little sheep. It was a pet. Slept with the family. It was a pet. Here's a man that's got all kind of sheep. He have guests come by. Instead of him feeding his guests with all those sheep he owns, he goes to his neighbor's house, takes the pet sheep, kill it, serve it to his guests. He said, David, what do you think should happen to a man that would serve a pet to his guests? He said, that man ought to be killed. You ought to he needs to be killed. I love Nathan. Some Sundays I have a Nathan spirit. He said, you the man. That's you. That take nerve after you done said it. You did that. And it broke his heart. Because some of the stuff we do, we don't even recognize. That's why you need God's spirit. Oh, I'm going so well. You know the story of Queen Esther. Now, Mordecai told her about the plot, but she's in a kingdom. She's a queen under who? A king that has government. And she tells him, he said, now, everybody know that in this king's province, everybody know this, whether a man or woman should come into the king, into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law. If I don't call you, and you walk in that inner court, 
put to death. Except. Everybody say except. To whom the king hold out the golden scepter. That he may what? Live. And then she said, but I have not been called in a month. But if you go to chapter 5, it say, and it was so. After they fasted and prayed, she went in the possibility that her life would be taken. She was standing in the court unsummoned. Then the Bible says she obtained what? Favor in his sight. Somebody ought to holler favor. That's what you have this morning. Stand in front of God. The king saw her. He's got a golden scepter. A staff is an, it's a, it's an emblem of sovereignty and power. So he's sitting in this chair. She's standing there. He has a golden staff. When he stretches it out, you're supposed to touch the end of it. Meaning life. But one writer picks it up in the book of Hebrews. It says to the son, God said, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. So one secular world has a scepter that's made out of what? Gold. And when he extended that gold staff, she touched it. So she could live. But watch this. After she touched it, he said, what is your request? Up to half of my kingdom will I give to you. What do you want from me? I just read Hebrew. Say he extended a staff to you of righteousness. One is temporary life. The other one is eternal life. Get the picture. He's handing it out saying, Ask what you will, and it shall be done. Reason why we don't get what we ask for, we don't know how sovereign he is. Anytime an earthly king will tell you, ask me for something. What he's saying, enlarge your request. We sit in church with very low expectation from a governing prince. That dwells in a life where no man dwelleth. That lives forever with all power. Can't say no problem with him. Get into the inner court and let him stretch out healing. Money ain't no problem. Favor. If he favors you. I know what I'm talking about. Ain't nothing in my life. Leading up to this point of 50 years of being saved would have been able to predict the favor of God in my life. I ain't had no daddy what I'm doing with 26 grandkids. 17 of them are boys. Didn't know I, when my mother wanted to get married, I was 17. She said, what do you think about me getting married? I said, you should have done it when I was a kid. I said, I don't know nothing about no daddy. I thought those were men walking around in their underwear, bossing people around. I said, I can't use that right now. Wait till I get out of here. I'm not going, ain't, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm in there being, you know, it was uh, uh, three boys, one girl at the time. And I'm like, uh, chill with the marriage thing. Because too many grown men up in here. <laughs> I said, you get married to whoever you want to get married to. But wait till I leave. Because I'm not going to be up in here scrapping with no joker trying to tell me what to do. <laughs> totally misconception of what a man should be. But when I got saved, I prayed. And he extended the scepter. I said, teach me how to be a daddy because I don't know what that is. Teach me how to be a husband. You know I'm messed up. All I got, I got it in the street. I need you to unravel it. The government on this show. 
He rules. That's why he can take an ex-weekend dope fiend, no daddy, and make a father out of him and give him many children. I was just in Atlanta visiting my great-grandson. He can't even talk, but I was trying to put my name on him. I said, say, Papi. And he's so observant, I just held my mouth open on the pa. I said, pa, pa. He he can't say his daddy yet, but he said, pa. I said, you got the first half. When I come back, we'll get the P, pa, P. I'm the great granddaddy. You have been born into royalty. He doesn't even know it. I didn't fly there for no reason. I went there to let him know his lineage. You might not know where you came from, but I do. You come from a line of royalty that God brought me out of the dung heap and put me as a prince in his church. When he look up, he's going to be laying on the altar because we're going to dedicate him. Some people in the world, every time, wait, wait, wait. Wait till he make his own choice. Why do you think they circumcised Jesus on the eighth day? In Judaism, the baby didn't have no choice about being Jewish. They wake up, they circumcise. I was looking at, I love seeing Jewish people. Them little babies had a little yarmulke on their heads, a kettle they just be walking around. Little fringes hanging out from under their suit coat. And I walked up, I, I walked up to the mother. She had two little babies. They could talk. One was a girl, one was a boy. I said, ma'am, excuse me. Does he know the Shema? She said, yes. She said, me and my daughter, we shout. But the men pray. I looked at that boy. I said, say it, son. He said, hear, oh, God. He said, one God. That's the hear. Our God is one. That's what the baby said it to me. And you had the audacity to get up on Sunday morning and leave them babies at home like they got a choice. That's presiding. Once I got saved, everything went to church. Crying, pouting, you with me. And then when they got old enough to drive by themselves, how much time do I have left? Y'all quiet, that means I'm out of time, right? (laughs) I said, everything is coming with me. One of my son's friends spent the night I didn't even know he didn't, he was up there. Because sometimes I had kids in my house, I didn't know it was there. We all get home from church, he opens the door. I said, what are you doing here? He said, I spent the night. I said, so how did you get out of going to church? I said, if I knew you was in that bed, you'd come with me. And to this day, we friends, because I would stay on him. That's what government does. I'm in this country. We have developed into a country where people don't even pledge any allegiance. All of our life we stood up in elementary school, put our hearts, hands right here. I pledge allegiance to God and my country. You know, you just said it. And then I had one young man, because he was, excuse me, uh, my listening audience. Jehovah Witness. We somewhere, they, the flag go up. Brother man sitting down. Wouldn't even get up. I said, dude, what are you doing? I'm Jehovah and we don't believe in worship. I said, this is not about worship. I said, men have lost their lives for the freedom you enjoy. And you have the audacity to sit there under protest. I said, you don't do it. I know I had a hard time Memorial Day last year putting my flag out because people thought I, you know, it was a political statement. And it wasn't. I lost a brother in Vietnam, didn't live but a week over there fighting <coughs> in that war. 
one week. I was so mad they killed my brother. I was 17. He was 20. I went to Fort Wayne to join. You know I ain't had no sense. I needed saving. I said, oh, you don't kill my brother. Somebody going to die. I was trying to join the army. I said, oh, I'm going to kill some folk when I get there. And God said, you're crazy. You know, they lost my physical records and everything. I was trying to go and die with my brother. When I went down there, they said, we can't find your records. You go home, young man, and we'll call you when we locate your physical and your records. And I was watching guys. I said, what are you doing? Fainting. When they was taking our blood, there was so much blood everywhere because then when they take your blood, they ain't trying to be no nurse. That's true. They just stab you. Next, 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 blood squirt. Brother man in front of me, he said, boom. I said, I said yeah, he, yeah, he fell out. I said, I don't want him with me in Vietnam. I said, he ain't got no heart. He just fell out at the sight of blood. I saw him doing like this. He was looking at that towel and all that blood on the floor, and I'm gritting my teeth saying, just point me in the direction. God said, no, you will go over there and die like a lot of other young men, but I have something else I want to do with you. That's governing. If you're in the government, and, and our laws will subpoena you for court, there's certain things you, it ain't the 10 suggestions. See, if there's no penalty, then it's a suggestion. Those are not 10 suggestions. People come to church think God is suggesting good things. There's a repercussions for disobeying government. Oh, yeah. And you can't even die out of tax. A friend of mine owned a, a cleaners from his father. It was an inheritance. His father didn't report all the money he was making in that cleaner. The son took the cleaners and reported it, and they showed up after he done distributed the inheritance. And the federal government said, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. how did you make this much money in one year? He said, what do you mean? He said, all our records show your father owned this business, and each year it was much less than this. He said, tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to prorate it. I'm going to only go back five years or so, and you're going to pay this amount. He said, because you can't inherit our money. What your dad, in other words, the daddy couldn't die away from that debt. Y'all right. ain't going to help me. Right. I'm talking about the government on his shoulder. Anytime the federal government won't let you inherit your daddy's money after he's dead, they will collect it. They have the authority. Hurt these college students too. Won't forget. How you going to not be able to declare bankruptcy on a college loan, but you can do it on a restaurant? Baby, spend all their money, two, three hundred thousand dollars in college debt. And then they fighting over whether they should forgive it. I wish they knew a God that had a year of jubilee where he forgives everybody's debt. I could preach all night, but I got the clothes. The government shall be on. Paul told Timothy that Jesus gave a good confession in front of Pontius Pilate. I was going to preach Pontius Pilate and Jesus in the judgment hall. I'm talking about the government. Great price was paid. Can you imagine he was a king and he is being judged like a bum? Pilate comes out. The high priest done gave him over to be crucified. He said, I don't find no fault in it. So he asked Jesus, are you a king? He just keeps saying it. Jesus said, did you hear this from me? Or somebody tell you I was a king? He said, am I a Jew? Your people brought you to me. I'm cutting to the chase. Do you know how they were able to get Jesus crucified? Because Pilate couldn't find anything wrong with him. He said, he's innocent. What do you? He made himself to be God's son. 
And in our religion, he should die. These are priests, chief priests. And when Pilate was trying to get rid of him, he was going to let Jesus go because he, you know, he was like, I'm not going to mess with this guy. He tried several times to let him go. Couldn't do it. Give me the, oh, he's gone. I was like, give me the soft music. Listen very carefully. Listen very carefully. Guess what they said to get him to be crucified? They told Pilate, Pontius Pilate, if you let him go, you're not Caesar's friend. And he said, Caesar. Now, they under Roman rule. They hate it. But all of a sudden, to get Jesus crucified, they say, you want me to crucify your king? They said, we have no other king but Caesar. Those priests said, we have no other sovereignty in our life but Caesar. No, they wasn't telling the truth. That frightened Pilate, so he had to hang him for treason. You know what treason is? You're supposed to be loyal to this state, but you commit your loyalty to a foreign power. That's what he was struggling with. You got the earthly government and the government of God always in certain instances but up against each other. As a people of God, do not get into that. Whichever way you're going to vote, vote. Do it in private. That's why they got booths. And we're so contentious. We put signs everywhere so our neighbor know we ain't with them. When all you got to do is go in there and do what you do. It's contention, it's division. Because the devil know if he can divide us, no kingdom can stand divided against itself. We're all Americans. And most of us don't even know what that means today. We're so individualized. That's why I was teaching the brother about dressing for an occasion. Because if you don't know the occasion, you won't change your clothes. And now kids don't even know it's inappropriate to wear pajamas to the airport. One lady was on the phone. She had a house coat on, waiting on the plane. I said to my wife, that lady has a house coat and pajamas. And everybody's scared to govern their own businesses. They won't. They, won't. they didn't say nothing. I guarantee you wouldn't get on a plane if I was the pilot in pajamas. They'd have to fire me. I said, come on, I'm going to buy you an outfit before we fly. You can sleep in that. I'm going to get you a suitcase. You put your the, the sleepwear in there and put this on. Because what it does, it dismantles the whole system. Because you live more in society than you do by yourself. And we got, I got to quit. You know what we're creating? I'm going to give it to you raw. Sociopaths. You Google it and watch one of the things, one of the behaviors of a sociopath is they disregard other people in society. They don't feel nothing. No guilt. That's it. I had a guy sitting next to me, gym shorts, up to here, hairy legs on the plane, all the uh, dude, get your knee off me. Why would you wear that knowing these seats that close together? Now I gotta put up with you. Cause you didn't think about you was gonna be flying next to me. Some of us don't like washing up, but if you get ready to be in the close proximity on a plane, yeah, at least hit the sink, throw some water up. You don't, you don't want nobody sitting next to you for three hours. You know, that's government. And people think that they have the right to disregard other people that's living in the same vicinity as them. 
You tell them, you can't wear that. Why? You can't tell me. <laughs> and then we're trying to live together. One of my oldest sons one time tried to tell me, I don't have the Holy Ghost yet. Can I play my music in my room? I said, here's the problem. You have no room. It's my room. And you're in it. And I say, here's the bigger picture. You got little brothers looking at you, wanting to be like you. Would you destroy their life because you want a tip? I said, son, won't nobody know you ain't saved in here but God and the devil. If you behave, if we all do the same thing, the babies have the power of choice. But if we're doing something different, they're guessing. I said, so I need you to cooperate. He at that age, you know where they give you that look. Then they walk off with that. <laughs> I'm looking around. And I told you, act like this is the first time I told you this. He didn't want to wear his Christmas sweater for the family picture. My wife said, what, what's this? I, I don't want to wear that. He's feeling a little mad. I feel you. I got you, Doc. I went in the room, he came out with that red sweater on. My wife said, how did you get him to do it? I said, I paid him. <laughs> Money is a motive. <laughs> I said, how much for the red sweater? <laughs> he said, thanks, Dad. He didn't tell his mama he came out. She thought I was Jesus. <laughs> but she didn't understand. Tell your neighbor, don't always be a consumer. People think money is to be consumed. Money has power. The government collects our taxes first because you'd be in jail if they didn't take it out your check. Because some of us, I'm going to pay later. I'm going to pay. No. They get there to run this country. I don't have no problem with tax, paying taxes because I want police officers. I want soldiers. I want, you know, I want people to make my life easier. So, I pay taxes, and I don't beef about it because that's how you run a government, with taxes. But watch Jesus when they asked him, do your disciples pay taxes? He said, I tell you what, go to the brook. Open the fish mouth. There's going to be some money in there. Pay my taxes and yours. So he covered Caesar. Caesar got the money. And you got the miracle. Because <laughs> what he's saying, does he charge his children? You're free. You don't know what's getting ready to come your way if you understand what government you're under. Don't you use all your prayers on flesh. No matter who gets in office, let me tell you, this cast one and one, everybody say, puppet government. You know what that means. A puppet government is a government that's ran by somebody outside of it that afflicts the people inside of it because they're outside of it. I submit to you that's the devil because anytime he offered Jesus the government of this world to worship him, you think our candidates are not being solicited by him? That's why you pray for men and women in authority. Because the devil will offer them a deal. He's the puppet government. Anytime he tells Jesus, look at all of this. I'll give it to you if you worship me. Who is the young man that's in jail right now? The rap artist. What's his name? Diddy. P. Diddy. Did I get that right? Guess what the devil will do? He pay you, pay you, pay you, pay you till you flip out doing crazy stuff. Then he'll turn you in. There don't be nobody else. He a hit man. He'll send you to kill somebody. Then somebody kill you so you can't trace it back to him. Now that young man sitting there because there was not enough people in his life to govern his behavior. Sometimes you just need the right person by your side to say, hey, don't do that. No, man, you've been, 
better than that. I had a friend of mine save my life, driving high. He could tell I was getting ready to make that left turn through that red light. And he kept tapping me. He was sitting in the driver's seat. He drove like that. He said, they used to call me Shug. He said, Shug. I said, what? He said, don't try it, man. Don't try it. Because I was getting ready to try it. We both would have been dead. He was sober enough to tap me. He said, don't do it, man. Don't do it. And I listened. Because in my mind, you know, I ain't scared. I could do this. But some stuff you ain't doing. You just need somebody to hold your hand so you don't want to do that. I wish I was his friend making all that money. Because I have no respect to person. I said, are you out your mind? I wouldn't let Michael Jackson shave his nose that thin if I was his friend. I wouldn't. I said, stop. I said, stop it. What you doing, dude? I would. That cut like that. I said, don't do it. Your nose is nice. We're friends. I like you. These people don't need your nose that sharp. What was the other artist that the OD'd in the bathtub? Whitney Houston. I saw her singing, losing weight. I said, can't they feel something wrong? She's too skinny. Where's the people? But thanks be to God, stand on your feet. There is a Savior. He can help. Every time I hear a song, I run to you in my mind. I say, I wish you had a ran to Jesus. Just run to him. Let him Govern your life. Govern your speech. I had somebody call me the other day. I didn't answer because I wanted the right words. I said, Jesus, I'm not going to answer the phone. They're going to leave voice messages, but I want you to give me the right words. I'm going to just pick up and then I got to apologize because my flesh jumped out. Give me the right kind words to hit my target. I'm getting ready to pray. Please do not get caught up in this. People have left churches when pastors fall. They do. They they see, they be so into the pastor that when he hit the deck, they go to the bar. If he fail, I know how that feels. I had a young man used to pray all night and I would pray with him. We would go to Pontiac on Friday night, pray all night to Saturday morning. And he could pray too. I told God I want to be just like him. Taught me how to pray. And one day he left the church, shook the core of my being. I was like, God said, no, 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 no. He said, you'll find. I said, what happened to him? He said, he wasn't honest. You could pray a dishonest prayer to be heard and seen of other folk. And he was doing it good, too, because I said, I want to pray like him. He could pray all night. I ain't telling him to nod out and wake up and continue. But it was to impress the people that was there. He said, don't be like that. He said, if you have one word in prayer and you're honest with me, I'll bless you. One word. Be honest. Our God and our Father, you have released in the earth a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Your kingdom is the greatest government there ever will be because it rules in our hearts. It controls our whereabouts, our thoughts. It controls our resources. We give because you put generosity in our hearts. We care for one another because you say these are your children. God, I pray moving forward, no matter what happens and whoever it is as president, that you will remain our sovereign king. And we will not submit your authority to human flesh. 
In Jesus' name, amen, and it is so. Give the Lord a hand, praise. You can come now. how many times God has provided his word for you think about it Bishop and I have been over a hundred years ministering and yet it's like the first time we ever received Jesus and that's where it begins so we're going to ask you to pray with me and those who are online same thing to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. Heavenly Father, we ask you that we might receive your Son, Jesus, as our Savior and Lord. Father, forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness and bring us to the kingdom of your dear son. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As you pray this prayer for the first time, we welcome you to the kingdom of God. If you have fallen short at some point, God is a God of forgiveness to bring you back. So we are thankful that we have that opportunity every single day. His mercies are new every morning. And now we have the time of offering. Well, we got two people that want to. And you may be seated for now as we're going to give the offering. As I was praying this morning, the Lord gave me a scripture out of the Gospel of Luke. And it's Luke 12, 32. And Jesus said, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have, give alms, and provide yourself money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Do you have treasure in heaven? You can. Do you know that God desires what's best for you? Do you know if there was only one, Jesus would have come and died for us? That one individual. Because he cares so much for us. So give and it will be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, overflowing. God will give into your bosom or storehouse. Amen? Amen? And while you are giving, we're going to look at some announcements that have been shared for us this week. This week is small group week. Hallelujah. If you need a small group, you can look online talk to some of us here in the church we will be able to help you with that please join us next Saturday morning for prayer online they say via zoom um, and uh, we do need uh, pantry goods to contribute to the pantry we know we put these things out and boy they go rather quickly and some of us gave a good amount but they just keep you can put them in in the morning, and by afternoon, it's gone. And that's where we need to be helping others and ministering for them. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. You'll see some of the great preachings and teachings. 
and I get to see Bishop again. Hallelujah. <laughs> and our fast is over today. Well, must not have been no many people fasting here. <laughs> you can go out and have a good burger or whatever else you want. But always be sure to give thanks to God before you eat it. Because you don't know what might be in there. Yeah. Prayer and thanksgiving. Uh, we will invite you to a marriage retreat on November 15th and 16th. The information is on the secular table out in the lobby. Harvest Fest date has been moved to November 23rd. Outside event for our community. We need as many of you to help make that day a success for the community. Please see Deaconess Nicole if you're interested in being a part of the committee. Men, please take an active part being this because I need your strength. Quite a few different roles. People to run games. I volunteer to get dunked in the dunk tank, but I don't think they're going to do that because there'll probably be ice out there. <laughs> Good weather. But I think they eliminated the dunk tank. But anyway, people to pray and security. Lastly, we'll have Thanksgiving baskets to give to needy families to complete with all the things needed for their Thanksgiving dinner. Please see co-pastor if you have a family that you might know would benefit from this. Because there are people that have come through some very difficult times. And so we want to be at the hands of Jesus. We want to be there to love and help them. Amen? Well, if you're ready for your giving, you can stand up, watch your ushers there. They'll take care of that. You can come with that. If you all stand, please, while we dismiss, how about us giving Bishop a hand again for his great message? Awesome. And now, to him who is able to keep you from falling, may he give you every good thing to provide what you need when you need it. We ask this in the mighty and the precious name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. And remember, Jesus is Lord. Amen. <laughs>